watching Keeping It Green. I'm your host, Debbie Klugers, and today I have with me Mr. Frank Vincenti. He is the founder of the Wild Dog Foundation. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming out, Frank. It's my pleasure. So, um, you know that we usually start the show with an environmental tip right. and try to keep it um, similar to the show's topic. So why don't you okay. go ahead? I know that you brought well, some info. Sure. My only recommendation would be to hopefully preserve open space and wild land so we could preserve biodiversity and large carnivores. So There you go. But That's a great <laughs> idea. And the wild dogs that we're talking about today aren't uh, domestic uh, right. canines. These are actual wild dogs, coyotes, right. wolves, and all kinds right. of sure. interesting well, animals. Well, wild dog, unfortunately, is a generalized term and, you know, confusing to some. But, uh, right, it's not about feral dogs, even though responsible pet ownership uh, negates that sort of thing. But, you know, dogs are diverse in the wild species, just like the cats. So there's over 36 different species. Of found, wild dogs? Right, found throughout the world, except on Ant Antarctica is the mm -hmm. only continent with no, excuse me, wild canine species, okay. so, but. Um. <laughs> so tell me about your foundation and right. what's going on today. We've got, got a lot of, uh, Interesting and important uh, things going on. Well, it's a, a small uh, nonprofit uh, educational group. Uh, we have had, uh, you know, uh, uh, projects in the wild in the past uh, to educate the public on the biodiversity and the, the wild uh, canid, as we refer to it scientifically. Uh, not just wolves, but uh, coyotes. And in Africa, there's a diverse array of wild canines, the African wild dog, which is somewhat of the niche of the wolf and the jackal species and mm -hmm. many different fox species. And in Asia, uh, the dole, which is the Asiatic wild dog, and in South America too. But even locally, we're very much involved with uh, wolf recovery and uh, uh, coyotes in urban areas. So. Um, speaking of coyotes in urban areas, I was in Manhattan yesterday, and yesterday they were chasing and captured. No, they didn't capture. Oh, they, they didn't, didn't capture no. them. I thought they got did. away. Thankfully. <laughs> I thought they captured it this morning. Uh, no, uh, the uh, the animal. I don't know what happened as of this morning, but uh, yeah, I think this morning because I read on, online capture. that they they oh, tranquilized right. him. Oh, all right. And, then yeah, they did I capture didn't, I him. I didn't read that. I just know yeah. from last night that they uh, he got away from them. So. So it's so timely that that's your topic, yes. and and they're running around New York City. Right. Well, you know, this is part of the natural way of mammals disperse into new territory to find territories to, you know, raise their families and. Mm -hmm set up and that's what you're seeing now. And obviously the people of Manhattan don't want them there because they're chasing them for uh, days. And I, th <laughs> I think it's just the protocol of law enforcement to, you know, uh, have the public's uh, uh, best interest in, in mind, but also in regards to the animal, uh, I mean, even though me personally, uh, if coyotes feel that Manhattan is appropriate, then by all means it is appropriate, which okay. is what I want to educate the public on. Because, you know, uh, we don't give the animals enough credit that they, you know, if they choose to live in an environment, whether it's a hyper-urban environment like Manhattan, clearly they can make it. It's just a matter of uh, what's the degree of tolerance on our part. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to fault the police. Uh, they do a great job. I think they were just following a protocol to, for the public's interest and even for the animal, because naturally they tranquilize it. You know, re-releasing animals back into the wild is problematic uh, through state laws, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I'd have to research what the outcome of sure. this is. But that's what I was wondering. But uh, and you're going to be speaking uh, Saturday about this topic as well. Right, uh, Sunday, March Sunday. 28th. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, very timely, as you know, uh, coyotes have been uh, dispersing into Manhattan. It's not an invasion. It's not a Armageddon. It's a natural occurring. <laughs> <laughs> it's naturally occurring uh, within animal populations, mm -hmm. people as well. You know how many people move out of state to find new land, or house, or property. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing. Although you know there, there there might be things that people should be concerned about. Like I said in the tip that you told me to say is that uh, we have to see what might be causing this dispersal in, at the rate it's happening. It might be. Uh, too much pressure by people in the Bronx and Westchester, or mm -hmm. too much overhunting, too much development. You know, that does play a part too. Because, you know, uh, contrary to what the public might think, is that animals do not 
uh, breed out of control. They can regulate themselves. They they are dictated by the ha you know the habitat and sure. their food sources. Sure. So, uh, like I said, with coyotes coming into Manhattan, they feel that Manhattan is uh, an appropriate territory for them. Uh, certainly, these are urban. Uh, knowledgeable animals, uh, they probably wouldn't do well if they were relocated upstate. They know how to negotiate the highways, they know how to negotiate the traffic and the time that uh, people are more active and when they're less active. Are they uh, nocturnal? Uh, you know, noc nocturnal is really just to avoid people. Hmm. So uh, as you know, being out here, uh, certainly with the great wildlife rehab is and uh, conservation groups, uh, like th during this time of the year, raccoons and possums, uh, the public uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, they see an animal out during the day, uh, they always assume it's sickly. But, you know, there's babies being had now, and certainly with the terrible storms we had, that terrible rain and windstorm, mm -hmm. animals lie up and wait for that to be over. Then they sure. come out, uh, and they're looking for food. Okay. So it's not always sickly. Okay. Uh, this animal in uh, the west side of Manhattan, I think, was... Uh, uh, Pretty much confused. Yeah, people I, I, were chasing him all yeah, over. <laughs> it's uh, you know even the way that it was reported uh, from the public, they saw him or her uh, coming out of the Holland Tunnel, and everybody assumed he was coming from Jersey. <laughs> I guess he saw Jersey Shore or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think uh, he uh, it's one of those animals that was seen recently and uh, decided to traverse into Holland Tunnel saw there was cars and the, hmm. the acoustics of the tunnel uh, reverberating made him confused and he came sure. back out. People assumed he was coming out of there. Yeah. And then that's when he was... It's like the invasion of the coyotes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, uh, that's an invasion I'd like, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what brought you to this, uh, to be so interested in trying to protect these wild dogs of the world? I think like most people, it starts uh, in your childhood. You know, I was the Mutual of Omaha generation and, uh, you know, and uh, had dogs all my life and, uh, you know, always had a passion for those animals. And, you know, uh, as an adult, I figured I could try to do something about it, you know, you know, with many other great people out there that are doing things about it. And, you know, that's basically, basically it. What so. are some of these success stories that you've had with your organization? Well, my my group is very small, and uh, you know we did have a major project in India at one time with the the dole, the Asiatic wild dogs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as with most of these uh, large carnivore uh, conservation programs, they could end very tragically because the locals are not as tolerant, and you know they, so they they're a threat to the well, to their livestock. Well, uh, you know, and the misconception that uh, you know most people have, whether justifiably from uh, conflicts such as that, or uh, whether it's just a perceived uh, uh, threat. Okay. Uh, they were tragically poisoned, oh. and uh, the project fell apart. So uh, I guess that's not a success. But, uh, you know, I mean, as far as successes, uh, you know, I could count myself among the many advocates out there that got wolves back into Yellowstone. That's great. That, uh, you know, made more of a... Uh, a uh, uh, made more public knowledge about the African wild dogs plight, of which is critically endangered. Uh, certainly, I think you said there's like 500 African wild well, the, dogs Well, th this, this animal, the Ethiopian wolf, okay. uh, there's only 500 left wow. in all of Ethiopia. They are, you know, a, a highly specialized animal that's solely endemic to the mountains of Ethiopia. Mm. This is the most endangered carnivore in Africa, uh, the f second endangered canid in Africa. The, the second one is the, the African wild dogs, which is the largest okay. uh, wild canine. They're, they're, they're there's beautiful. only about 3,000 of them left. Wow. And, uh, but, uh, and you're critical. trying to help this species well, either. Right. Uh, I mean, educate steady. Americans in, in a, a appreciation of the diversity in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just the popular animals like elephants and sure. pandas, which are all very important. Sure. Uh, an animal like this which, uh, is what they call a keystone species right. or a flagship species, right. meaning that uh, one pack of wild dogs, uh, the average pack size 